Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of the Comic Review. My name is Eric, and today I've got to give props to DC because they did something I didn't think they were going to be doing for quite a while. So let's go ahead and start off with our review of Superman number two. So basically what I'm going to do and with congratulating DC on, um, didn't think they were going to do it, but they finally got through a Superman comic book without mentioning the death of the new 52 Superman. It just blew my mind as we were going through this book today. Um, we do have some mentions of the fact that new Clark or new, you know, pre-Flashpoint Clark is a new Superman, but I don't think, think I thought I read through it one or two times. We didn't get one mention of dead Clark Kent. We didn't get one mention of new 52 Superman that, you know, oh my gosh, he died for, you know, whatever reason. Oh, now we have this new guy, but the old guy is dead. And Oh my gosh, I was there for you, you know, talking about, you know, uh, R. Clark's uh, mindscape. You know, it's like, oh, you know, you, you died and this, that, and the other, and I'm honoring your memory. We didn't get any of that. And I, for one, was actually glad about it. Um, not because I want to, you know, uh, lessen the sacrifice of the New 52 Superman, but it just seemed like DC was beating our heads with it for weeks. You know, the, it happened, and we got it in uh, the DC Rebirth special. Uh, we got it in the first couple issues of Action Comics with the uh, Rebirth. We got it in the first issue of Superman. We got it in the uh, Superman Rebirth issue. And I was just thankful that it was done. So um, I haven't read Justice League yet, so I don't know if that got mentioned in there anywhere. But uh, yeah, it just it did not seem like we were overly beaten over the head with the fact that we have a new Superman. Anyway, let's go ahead and get straight into the review and uh, see what actually happened in this issue. So anybody who has read the first issue of Superman or you watched the... Uh, last review I did on uh, the previous issue, you know that uh, things were left a little ominous. Uh, Jonathan had overheard a conversation between Clark and the Justice League, and uh, Clark came to his room after they had left, uh, telling them, we need to leave now. A very uh, dark, ominous moment. He was just in a, uh, Clark was just a shadowy figure in the, in the doorway, and we get to this uh, first page and we're all smiling. Everything is okay, you know, at least with the Kents. The Clark is taking Jonathan on to a uh, teachable moment, um, doing a little bit of training with him, taking him out into the Arctic to help with a uh, stranded submarine that's uh, lost out in the middle of the sea. The Clark and Jonathan are talking uh, during, this, uh, during this scene a little bit before we actually get to the action of the issue. Clark basically explaining that Batman and Wonder Woman are actually there to see him, uh, kind of checking up on uh, Clark more than they were checking up on Jonathan, just because of the fact that they want to make sure that uh, you know he's in check, kind of. They don't fully trust the fact that all of a sudden this alternate Clark Kent Superman has shown up out of nowhere. Clark says he basically assures them that he is on the up and up and that he's going to go deal with the submarine crisis and that Jonathan is the only backup that he would need, so they go to uh, rescue this downed submarine. Clark is able to fix the propeller and the engine and everything on the sub. It gets on its way, but then all of a sudden they get attacked by this giant octopus thing in the middle of the ocean that is being controlled by something. We don't know exactly what yet, but um, it, it is being controlled. This octopus squid thing has some kind of uh, uh, technology embedded into it, built onto it, uh, whatever. Clark engages it and tells Jonathan to use his heat vision in order to take it out. We then have a montage of Jonathan attempting to use his heat vision powers, which if you remember the last issue, he accidentally killed the family cat with. Um, so Clark, you find out, is more or less trying to teach Jonathan how to use his uh, heat vision, how to get a little bit of better control of it while helping dear old dad fight the giant octopus creature. During this fight, Superman and Son both uh, get various injuries. Jonathan, just from the fact that I guess his invulnerability hasn't fully kicked in yet, if that is a power he's going to be getting as the son of Superman. Clark more or less gets injured from Jonathan while he's uh, learning to use his heat vision powers. He basically keeps on hitting Clark with it. Uh, singes him a little bit, uh, some, some good burning on there, but not enough to take down the Man of Steel. When the fight is over with the uh, octopus creature, uh, Clark basically reveals to Jonathan that he knew that Jonathan had used his heat vision, and Jonathan uh, admitted freely what had happened. He explained the entire story to Clark. He didn't exactly explain the part where the little blonde girl, I think her name was Katie, saw Jonathan use his powers. You know, that's neither here nor there. So Jonathan and Clark fly back to Metropolis to uh, 
uh, tell Lois about what had happened to the family cat. Meanwhile, there's actually, a, and I was actually noticing this before anything happened with it, there's a bunch of blood splatters all over the ice um, during this fight, mainly from Jonathan. He actually, again, like I said before, his invulnerability hasn't kicked in, so uh, he did sustain a couple injuries during uh, the fight. Something in the ice, something actually scans the uh, blood in the ice to determine it is human Kryptonian hybrid blood. Whatever this thing is, it manifests itself kind of like a little fiery ball. It detects, again, the Kryptonian blood and then jets out of there. Meanwhile, we get back to the Kens back on the farm. Uh, Jonathan and Clark told Lois what happened. They bury the family cat out in the field. Uh, and then there's kind of like a exchange going on between Lois and Clark concerning, uh, you know, making sure that Jonathan is prepared for what's going to be happening, making sure that you know, he's, he's taught the proper way of his powers since Clark has been through this as the kid growing up with powers. Uh, he's in a better position to teach Jonathan about the use of his powers more so than Clark's own parents were. At the same time, we have Jonathan sitting up in a tree looking at the sunset and the little blonde girl, Katie, uh, comes to talk to them. She talks to him about the fact that she didn't want to reveal his secret. She figured out it was, it was something to be uh, kept between them. I can't remember if I mentioned this in the last video, but I'm, I'm a little bit suspicious of, of this little girl. I don't know uh, what it is about her, but I feel like she's just got some ulterior thing going on. I know, I, I do know I said in the last issue that I hope she's kind of like a Lana Lang figure to Jonathan, but um, I also have suspicions. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's j just something I'm expecting and, and, you know, with comics or whatever, that the only reason we're introducing characters is to portray other characters. I said the same thing about Clayface over in Detective Comics. So I don't, I don't know what it is about, you know, uh, secondary cast members that make me think that they're just out to get the heroes, um, despite whatever their intentions are. But uh, I'm really hoping I'm wrong about that, but uh, we'll, we'll have to see what goes on with, with Katie. During Clark and Lois's uh, conversation, uh, she does open up a package that is from the Lois Lane of the New 52 Earth. Uh, we don't know what is in there yet, you would just see that the envelope is addressed from L. Lane uh, going out to uh, Lois Smith, So, which is interesting to me because unless New 52 Lois has investigated pre-Flashpoint Lois, they don't shouldn't know about each other. I don't think they crossed paths during the uh, uh, Final Days of Superman storyline and unless something happens in Action Comics uh, that would reveal the two um, as knowing each other because I'm almost positive the current storyline in Action Comics takes place before this story um, then as far as I know neither one sh or the New 52 version shouldn't know about the existence of the pre-Flashpoint version unless she's just making a assumption because of the fact that there's a new Clark Kent Superman flying around. But then how would she have known where she lives? So there's a little bit of questions about this. Why does New 52 Lois know of even the existence of the pre-Flashpoint Lois? But uh, I'm sure those will be questions we'll hopefully get an answer to in the next couple of issues because we actually don't get anything resolution here. We find out that Jonathan up in the tree with Katie, the tree limb broke, he fell and got a concussion. Katie and her grandfather bring Jonathan to Clark and Lois and Clark kind of has an overbearing, overprotective dad kind of thing with uh, not wanting to take Jonathan to the hospital. Katie and her dad leave um, and Clark decides that the only place to find out what's wrong with Jonathan because all he has is a minor concussion would be to take him over to the Fortress of Solitude. However, whatever that uh, energy ball thing is, it has now shown up in the Fortress of Solitude. It's interacted with some of the computer equipment as well as, I guess, taking DNA off of uh, a pair of glasses that were in the Fortress um, belonging to one of two Clarks. Not uh, sure which one. However, there's a press badge next to the uh, glasses, so I can only assume it's the new 52 Clarks uh, glasses. Um, but this energy being fuses with them as well as other things in the fortress and you find out, spoilers, that it is the Eradicator, who I believe was first introduced during the original Death of Superman back in the 90s. Um, and it's interesting because this version of the Eradicator has uh, the classic uh, blue and black costume, the weird goggles and the cape and everything. He looks exactly like the version from the Reign of the Superman storyline. Um, from back in the 90s. So I thought it was a little interesting that they decided to go with a uh, classic version of that character. Even the pre-Flashpoint version, I don't even think uh, wore a costume uh, like his original by the time the uh, uh, pre-Flashpoint era was over. So it's kind of interesting that they went back and decided to go with that original costume for this character. 
It's unclear whether or not this is a new version of the Eradicator native to the new 52 universe or if it is somehow some version of the pre-Flashpoint Eradicator that also came over from the Convergence world. Um, we're not told about that at all because all we basically see is the Eradicator at the end. It talks about wanting to save Kal-El. Um, so I'm not sure, we're not sure what he's doing. Most likely in about two weeks or so, we're gonna find out in number three, get a little bit further into what exactly the Eradicator's purpose is. I know I've said it before in other videos, but I cannot stress enough how much I enjoy uh, Peter Tomasi's uh, writing on this series and uh, on how well he's been doing on Superman uh, all together, especially with the final days of Superman and this story here. Uh, Patrick Gleason as well, the artist, uh, the two, the two of them worked together on Batman and Robin uh, during the early days of the New 52, going through into the uh, Death of Damien story and the uh, aftermath of all that. Um, I'm actually pretty sure that team stayed for the most part throughout that entire book's run. Uh, it's just good for me to see that team um, handle this book because of the fact that I think they do very well. They did very well with the um, father-son dynamic with Batman and Damien, so I, I feel like they're they're bringing that here in a different perspective, obviously, because Clark and uh, Bruce are totally different characters. I like how they still keep those the simple theme of a bond between a father and son going, even though the personalities of the characters are completely different. That all those uh, father-son moments still shine through in this book. So, what did you think of this uh, second installment into the Son of Superman storyline? Let me know in the comments what you thought. Did you like the reintroduction of the Eradicator back into uh, the New 52? Did you appreciate Clark's more nurturing approach to dealing with uh, what's going on with Jonathan, uh, especially since we were kind of left wondering what he was going to do at the end of the last issue? Let me know what you guys think, as well as any other insights you have into this issue. So I'd just like to thank you guys for watching this latest installment of the Comic Review. If you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and give this video a like, as well as subscribe to the channel. Uh, you can catch up with uh, us on social media, uh, Facebook and Twitter. We post uh, on there anytime we put up a new review. And I'd just like to thank you guys for watching. And I will see you guys in the next review. Later.